We've been working for some time now with uh, satellites and, um, and computer models to track how, how freshwater availability is, is changing all over the world. And I want to share that with you um, this morning. And we got a great uh, lead in last night from our speaker last night who showed uh, uh, one, uh, one key slide of ours in particular and talked about uh, how we're able to monitor groundwater depletion um, all over the world. So what you see behind me are some images from a few key papers that we've written on California and um, on the Middle East and on India. And in fact, the India paper was the, was the first one that we wrote. And <clears throat> you know, it's interesting as a, as a hydrologist, um, that, you know, you work for years and years and years doing some uh, relatively boring things that, that no one cares about. Um, <laughs> And you know, you write one paper about how there's some groundwater losses in India, and uh, and everything and everything changes. But uh, the satellite has handed us a lot of uh, very compelling information, and I do want to share that with you this morning. So I'll start off by you know, so uh, California. If you didn't know, uh, California is in pretty rough shape, and so I thought I would start off looking at California, looking at this satellite Grace that we heard about last night. Um, and talk a little bit about how it works, look a little bit about California, then look at the rest of the world, and then maybe see what we can do about it uh, as individuals, as professors, as, as foundations, and mainly that's on the communication side, which is why I give so many talks. Uh, okay, so how bad is the California drought? It actually is pretty bad, and I'll show you through a few slides, starting with this one. <laughs> Uh, about how bad it is. Uh, ironically, it is starting to rain, and uh, the big hope now in California is for uh, the El Nino and how much rain it's going to bring, and will it end the drought? And the answer is no. Uh, and the answer is we need about four years of above average precipitation. You know, three or four nice wet El Nino winters would be great. Um, we're doing great as a state in terms of saving water, especially in the metropolitan regions. My fear as someone who watches this stuff pretty closely and talks to a lot of water managers is that we will get derailed by the, by the rainfall because people just want to forget that, that really in California what we have is chronic water scarcity that's uh, really exposed and exacerbated by drought, but it's really a, a long-term problem. Anyway, so if I want to get rich, I can sell California umbrellas. Uh, so here's some satellite data from a satellite called MODIS showing the comparison. You've probably seen some of these. NASA's pretty good at, at, at churning these things out. So you know, when we think about where the water is, right? It's in the snow, it's in the rivers, it's in the reservoirs, it's in the soil moisture, it's in the groundwater. Well, all of those are basically at historic lows. We see a number of papers that might suggest it's the driest, hottest winter ever in the last 500 years, the last 1,000 years. It's not a competition. It's really bad, and the population is greater than, than it's ever been. So we're in pretty rough shape. This one shows from a NASA MODIS satellite just a, a, a wet snow year, 2011, which is sort of the beginning of the drought. We sort of take this as a nominal beginning of the drought. It was a, actually sort of a, a small a mini El Nino. So it had a lot of snow. And then this is what we saw on March, uh, March 31st. And so you know we derive a lot of our uh, of our surface water, of course, comes from the snow melt in the Sierra Nevadas. This is uh, a figure from my colleague, Tom Painter. Some of the measurements that we're doing at NASA, a lot of it is, is geared at getting to higher and higher resolutions and integrating these data into computer models to do better, uh, to better understand what's going on and to do better prediction. Tom flies around in a small aircraft and measures uh, snow in these two basins here, the Tuolumne and uh, I'm not sure what the other one is, but the Tuolumne is the, uh, is the red one. They're both up around Yosemite. And he gets measurements that are down at the, you know, just a few meters scale. And what these plots show are the melting of the snowpack, and the top line is 2013, and the middle line is 2014, and the bottom line is 2015, and it's across the snow season, so starting in February. And so basically it's just telling us there's less snow every year, and we're able to track it. Actually, these measurements are an improvement in resolution by compared to the guy in California who goes out on his cross-country skis and, and you know, sticks snow stakes into the ground. It's an improvement of, uh, by a factor of 39 million. Uh, so it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and so we hope to expand this across the Sierras. We don't need satellites to tell us uh, how low the reservoirs are. They're, they're pretty low, and Lake Mead hit uh, a record low 
um, last summer it's the biggest reservoir in the United States and, and supplies a lot of water to Southern California and certainly a lot of power. Um, and a lot of the reservoirs, I think I just saw the federal reservoirs were, I forgot what it was, less than a third, maybe a quarter, uh, a quarter full. The point with the reservoirs is, you know, they never really hold, reservoirs are not, they're kind of like a checking account. They're not meant to hold all of your money, right? They're meant to hold some for, for quick access. And so we're never gonna store more than, than three or so years of water in, in California. And if they don't, if they don't refill, uh, then, you know, they were in trouble. That's, that's where we're at. Okay, yeah, I don't need to show this to you guys, okay? But I put it here uh, only to emphasize to those of you who do give a lot of talks and maybe students that might be out there uh, or people that are speaking to the public, a lot of people don't know what groundwater is. And it took me a while to figure out that I could go through a whole presentation talking about the importance of groundwater and someone would come up to me at the end and say, yeah, what is groundwater? Uh, so I've taken to putting this in presentations, uh, not for you folks, but just as a reminder that we do need to have slides like this and slides like the next one, which this one, which really emphasize the importance of groundwater, how much of, and we, uh, again, we heard it last night, uh, how much of the world's uh, water is actually groundwater, uh, maybe 33% of the water withdrawals uh, worldwide, about two billion people rely on groundwater. You folks, you folks know all this, uh, but for those of us in the Western United States, groundwater becomes a really, really important strategic reserve, especially during drought. And we're seeing that in California right now. Right now in California, we're probably getting about 75% of our statewide water supply uh, from groundwater. Um, and in many parts of the of the world. And even still in California, groundwater, as you know, is pretty poorly uh, managed and monitored. Uh, so in my opinion, and we saw it last night, and we'll see it again today, I think that regional and global water security is at far greater risk than, than is currently acknowledged. And there's lots of historical reasons for that, some of, some of which have to do with population, some of which have to do with technology. And, some of which have to do with just basic understanding of the water cycle and the interrelationship between surface water and groundwater. So what I'm gonna show you, much of the rest of what I'm gonna show you uh, is uh, based on our work with the GRACE satellite. We started back in 1995, 96 with my graduate student at the University of Texas, Matt, Matt Rodell, and Matt is uh, on the other, uh, other coast. I'm at JPL now, he's at Goddard Space Flight Center on the East Coast. Um, and we continued to work together. We just had our science team uh, proposal renewed, so we'll keep going for another four or five, three or four, whatever, somewhere between three and five years. Uh, we're chronically underfunded, by the way. I'll just throw that out there in case you feel bad for me. After we can pass the hat, Jane. Is that okay? We can pass the hat. Okay, that sounds good. We can split. Okay, so so Grace, you heard a little bit about it last night. Stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. Uh, it was launched in 2002. Uh, I'll describe this, uh, that bullet point in just a second. I wanted to show you the size. You know, they're not very big. They are about the size of a squashed minivan uh, each. I think if you took maybe uh, these tables here, these two tables together, and maybe doubled them, that's about the size of uh, one, of the, one of the gray satellites. Um, they fly at about 400 kilometers altitude, and they're separated by about 200 kilometers, and they follow each other around in a, what we call a near-polar orbit. And the reason I say that they are like a scale in the sky is because as they fly over, uh, their, their positions are very accurately tracked. The, the primary measurement that the satellites are making are the positions of the other satellites. So they're looking at each other, they're not taking pictures of the ground. Uh, and that's done with laser ranging and, uh, and GPS. And the position is, is recorded to at the submicron level. So it's extremely, a uh, micron is a, thousand, a, a thousandth of a millimeter. So it's really, really accurate. Um, and so as the two satellites uh, fly over a place, say like Texas, you know, we just had the huge flooding in Texas, there's a lot more water mass on the ground. And that mass, that additional mass, exerts a greater gravitational tug on the satellites. And so as they fly, if this is Texas, as they fly over, they get pulled down just a little bit. Okay, first one comes in and gets pulled down and pulled in a little bit and then relaxes back into its orbit. And then the second one comes down, it gets pulled in, right? So the distance, the up and down and the vertical movement is changing. 
Likewise, when they fly over a place that's uh, during, uh, in a drought, like California or a region that has a lot of groundwater depletion, there is less water mass on the ground. So there's less of a gravitational tug um, on the satellites. And so they actually float just a little bit higher um, in their orbit. So by keeping track of the position of the satellites, we're able to map out the regions of the world that are gaining or losing water on a monthly basis. Okay? GRACE is really um, a satellite that is designed more for what we call in the field hydroclimatology. Okay, we're really looking over large areas, 250,000 square kilometers, 200,000 square kilometers. We can get down to 100,000. Depending on how much data we have, we can get down to smaller scales, but say roughly 150,000 square kilometers and greater, uh, and a monthly and longer time scales. Okay, so we're not going to be able to predict the weather or help weather prediction, say, on uh, the University of Nebraska campus, but we are able to track sort of the overall water availability in the state of Nebraska or across the high plains, and, and, and I'll show you that. And then if, from a global perspective, of course, that's, that's pretty amazing to be able to see that picture and track it monthly and track the trends in ways that we never have able, uh, been able to do before. Um, Grace, so what are the other caveats? It doesn't tell us the absolute amount of water. It only tells us the change. It tells us the change in a big region on a monthly basis, basically of how much water weight this place has gained or lost. Okay, so it's like if you got on a scale and the scale told you you, you gained five pounds this month and five pounds the next month and then you lost five and then you lost five. That's what, that's what Grace is telling us for these big watersheds or, or big aquifers. And the other thing, the third thing, is that it tells us in an integrated way um, the total amount of water storage change. It cannot tell us that it's just groundwater or it's just soil moisture. We need other, other information. And in NASA, we're trying to build a, a suite of satellites to, to, decompose that, uh, to decompose that signal. And I'll show you more about that in, in some different slides. So, uh, Grace is almost, uh, so after saying all that, this mission is almost dead, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it does have a follow-on, which is named the follow-on. Um, <laughs> and it is a going, it's basically the same mission. It's called the Climate Continuation Mission in the, in the NASA language. So really no improvements to uh, the technical specifications. It's just a continuation of of these records, not only of what's happening with fresh water, but the glaciers and uh, ice sheets and, and ocean mass. So we're really looking at all of global water and how, and how it moves around. Uh, so that's going to launch from Russia in, if we're still talking to those guys, in, um, in 2017, in August. And I hope to actually go out there. Um, and yeah, it actually does. OK, I'm not going to explain this. I just want you to put this away in your brain with your California umbrella image and pull them out later. Uh, but actually, this is kind of how grace works. I'll let you think, no, don't think about it now because then you'll just forget the rest of the talk. All right, uh, so I wanna show you what some of the data look like spatially and then at one point or one region over time. We're looking at monthly variations now. Um, and so the reds are drier than the average time period here, and the, which is 2002 to, I think it's 2014, uh, and let's see, 2013. Uh, let's see if I can run that again. So the blues are uh, wetter than normal. Well, let me explain this first. There's a time series here, which I'll explain in a second, but really what we're looking at is the smooth, you were looking at an animation of the yellow line, which starts in 2003, ends in 2013, so about 11 years of data, really focusing on California, the Sacramento, San Joaquin River basins, looking at the ups and downs, the monthly variations of total water storage. Uh, so blue is wet season, red is dry season. Towards the end, we're getting into the drought, so you should see, you should see some more red. These, this is an animation that we actually did for 60 minutes and they reject it. They said, this sucks, man, we don't, we don't want you. <laughs> <laughs> we do not want this animation. You have to do a better one for us. Uh, and uh, I'll show you some still pictures from, from that one. 
so that's kind of, and these are online. If you go to uh, my website or just NASA, JPL, my website is just my name. And all the stuff is buried in there. There's a bunch of slides and pictures and things. So what does it look like then? Uh, uh, what does the time series look like? This is the time series for that same region, the Sacramento, San Joaquin River basins, outlined in red. There's the Central Valley there, big agricultural region, just like the Ogallala, except we grow more produce and fewer grains. Um, starting in 2002, going up to 2014, uh, that goes up to about June 2014, so just a little less than a year ago. One of the other uh, uh, caveats about GRACE data is that it's very complicated. It takes a while to process, and so we're always uh, sort of three to six to nine to somewhere between three and 12 months uh, behind. And it's a very, you know, it comes down to individuals, right? Who, who has the expertise? And we just lost actually one of our key uh, project scientists. He got recruited by the University of Texas, which is really like the mecca for the GRACE, uh, for the Grace uh, project. Uh, so we're a little bit slower. So we don't actually have the, the latest data processed yet. <laughs> Uh, so it's not all, you know, it's, it, it's not all wonderful, but still providing a, a great amount of information. So what are we looking at? Now we're looking at same, the same thing I just showed you, but the, but the chart, the time series for the whole uh, region outlined in red, the Sacramento, the uh, San Joaquin, and the Tulare Lake basins. And we're looking at the ups and downs of water storage, total water storage. I haven't pulled out the groundwater yet. Wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season. Our wet season is the winter. We're entering in it, into it right now, um, and and so you know you can see you can see a few things. We've got the annual variations, but there's also some some trends. Um, these are uh, sort of some some uh, outtakes from the animation that I just showed you, showing the dry season, increasing dry season dryness. But some other features of this time series that I think are important are here's the current drought it goes back to to 2011, and so now with GRACE we're able to quantify and say uh, over in each of the last four years, um, California or that, that region, took, the state has actually lost more, but the Sacramento and the San Joaquin River basins have lost 15 cubic kilometers of water each year. That's 12 million acre feet, that's four trillion gallons of water uh, each year. That's more water than all Californians use for domestic, and there's 30, almost 39 million of us now for domestic and municipal supply. And uh, about two thirds of that is coming from groundwater. So really we're ground, and, and the use of groundwater. So we're really looking at a combined drought signal and a human, all right, a human response to drought, which is to use more groundwater because we have to. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on. One of the other things, if you look at that last peak, and I've seen the latest data, by the way, and uh, the last winter of, 2014, 2015, the peak is right down here in the corner. So the, right, so the, the wet seasons are getting drier and drier. In fact, they're not even rising to the level of dry seasons. So we're not getting that replenishment of the, of the surface water that we normally would, and so we're using more and more groundwater. But you know, when we look at this chart, there's a couple of time, other time scales of drought, and arguably we could say that we've been losing water since 2006, and that peak there in 2011 was that mini El Nino that I referred to. Um, and, and really, um, we've been losing water the whole time that we have been looking at the GRACE data. And it turns out, I think that there are many places around the world, and we'll see it in our, in our global maps, that are, are facing chronic water scarcity. Um, and in California, the situation we see is that and, and you know, not many, the general public and even some of our water managers don't, haven't really gotten this yet, that the surface water, you know, we have our wet winters and our, and our dry winters. It comes, it comes and goes, right? We've got our wet ones, you can see some there, and we've had some real dry ones. We've had a string of dry ones, but the groundwater really just goes, and we've been depleting our groundwater in California for decades and decades. Uh, and so when you add those two together and look at the sum in ways that most people don't do, this is what you get, and it's a little, it's a little scary. Um, I'll talk about how we got this chart in, in just a, uh, a few slides, but it's a combination, and now we're looking at the groundwater. Of that signal that I just showed you, what part is groundwater? That's actually shown in green just for the last few years. That's our GRACE estimate of, of uh, groundwater depletion. 
And the red line is from the USGS uh, model and observations of uh, groundwater cumulative, groundwater depletion uh, in the Central Valley. And um, this is a slide that goes back to 1962. And this is from the 2009 report, and we got the data from Claudia Font at USGS and then tacked our gray stuff onto the end. And so the picture here, and the colors in the background, by the way, uh, represent whether it's a wet period or a dry period. And so a wet period is shown in the dark blue, a drought, a very dry period is shown in the tan, and a sort of intermediate wet dry is shown in the light blue or the light, or the light tan. Okay? And uh, the picture that emerges from here is very, very clear. And that is that uh, we get a little bit of recovery in a wet period and then a big decline in a drought. And a little recovery in a wet period and a big decline, right? And so that's the trajectory that we're on and we've been on it for, for quite a long time. So um, this is, I think, the definition of uh, unsustainable. One of the other things we've been able to do with the GRACE data, you know, it's pretty tricky. Um, in hydroclimatology, in meteorology in general, to define when does a drought begin, when does it end? One of the key questions I always get is, is it over, is it over, will this rain help? And one of the things we've been able to do with the GRACE data is start to pull out numbers about things like, when does a drought begin, when does it end, how much water does it take to get back to normal conditions? So one of the ways that we've done that is by, and we could do, I mean, this is totally transferable, right? So we could do it for uh, the upper Midwest, we can do it all around the world. And the paper that we first published from my student, Elise Thomas, really looked at four regions around the world. Um, so there's that GRACE time series for the Sacramento and San Joaquin River basins at the top. And once you have this sort of, you know, weight chart, weight, water weight gain and loss chart, uh, for a long period of time, you can take the average of it and see what the normal range of variations is. That's the middle, that's what we call the climatology, right? So on average, yes, we gain this much water in the winter, and on average, we lose this much in the summer. And so you can see how wet, or how by comparing the top to the middle, we can un begin to understand how wet or how dry it is compared to normal wet conditions or normal dry conditions. So when are we having a tremendous flood or when are we having a really bad drought? When did the drought period begin? That's what we've shown in red. So we just subtract the middle from the top and we're looking at how much drier than normal dry conditions we are in the Sacramento and San Joaquin River basins. And so this allows us to do a few things, which is to quantify and say, hey, this is when you know, a, 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 total, a deficit in total water storage as observed by the GRACE mission begins, and this is when it ends, and this is how big it is. It's you know, X cubic kilometers. In 2014, that number was uh, 42 cubic kilometers, or 11 trillion, uh, 11 trillion gallons, and it's kind of a linear growth. Um, and we just estimated it, uh, we're getting ready for a the EGU meeting and just uh, looked at the 2015 data. And we're, you know, it's, it's progressing along that line. We're up to a deficit of about 12 trillion, between 12 and 13 trillion gallons. So that's water in storage, by the way. That is not 12 trillion gallons of rain, which is actually not that much when you, when you add up an inch of rain over all of California. Um, so to accumulate uh, 12 trillion gallons of water in storage, um, that's, uh, by that I mean in snowpack, in soil moisture, in our reservoirs, and in the groundwater. Um, that'll take about three or four years of above average precipitation. So that's why I said that earlier in the presentation. Um, and so as many of you know, uh, it's not the only thing that's going on. We've got some serious subsidence going on in, uh, in California and in many places in the United States and, and around the world. This is a famous uh, picture of of Joe Poland from uh, USGS standing next to a telephone pole uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. And that number up there, 1925, right, that's where the ground surface was. Uh, and so there was subsidence of about a foot per year. Um, and that is absolutely ongoing. Uh, this is a slide from my colleague, Tom Farr at JPL, who looks at this with radar. Um, and in the upper left, we have the subsidence, oh, sorry, we're kind of looking in these regions here, uh, you see the hash marks, and we're really looking around the Delta of Mendota. If you look over on the right, we're looking in that, in that region. Um, 
upper, so it's the same region, upper left, uh, sort of pre-drought, uh, 2007 to 2011, and we've got some subsidence rates on the order of a few inches per year. Um, and then last year, last growing season in the lower right, May to October 2014, uh, subsidence at rates of uh, as much as a foot per year. And then uh, the updated report just came out and runs through January 2015, and there are some regions that are subsiding at a foot and a half to two feet per year. Okay, so we're able to track that now from radar. In fact, my colleagues are visiting uh, with the governor's office today to talk about mapping this statewide. Another interesting paper that came out uh, in the fall last year, so, you know, many of you know, uh, but maybe not everybody, that uh, there are, you know, when we place a water load on the surface or remove it, there's a crustal response, and what I just told you about was the subsidence response, which is kind of like letting air out of a bicycle tire or pumping air into a bicycle tire. So you let it out, it deflates, and, and that's the role that water plays, the role that air plays in the, in the tire, and the ground surface is the tire in the, in, in the analogy. But the other thing that it does, it's kind of like sitting on a couch cushion. When you sit on a couch cushion, say one that has like a memory foam, uh, not the cheap stuff we have at my house. Uh, uh, when you sit on it, it depresses, and when you get off it, it uplifts. And so water uh, over large areas uh, actually does the same thing. And so this is a study that came out using GPS, looking across the western US at the removal of the disappearance of water because of the drought. Um, the progressive uplift of the western United States, uh, shown in GPS. So red just means it's getting higher and higher, going from 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014. That response is much smaller, right? That's just a few millimeter response. It's not like the western US is like, you know, just gonna curl up and kind of flop over like an omelet. That was pretty good, I thought that was good. Uh, uh, so it's pretty slow, and the subsidence, the inflation, deflation, the poor elastic response is much, is much greater. But, but very cool and very, very interesting, got a lot of attention. Let's just dig a little bit deeper about uh, how we pull out groundwater from the gray signal. And then I'll show you some things that we're doing at NASA, and then we're gonna look at the rest of the world, and then we're gonna have a good cry. Uh, all right, so what Grace shows us is this. It shows us the change in uh, total uh, land water storage, which is the snow, the surface water, the soil moisture, the groundwater, basically all the water that you see in that watershed, or we could use a different shape. We can look at any arbitrary shape we want. Uh, if we want to get groundwater, we can rearrange and use Grace for a delta S land. And then we have to come up with that snow and surface water and soil moisture data to, uh, uh, to remove it. So uh, Grace gives us this. And if we want to focus on just the blue part, which is the groundwater, then we have to remove that. We have to subtract out that mass. It's not unlike, again, if we go back to the scale analogy, if your doctor told you that you gained 10 pounds in the last year, and you wanted to know where did you gain it in your head, well, you'd have to have measurements of the, right, of the rest of your body, which would be difficult, but I suppose, I suppose it could be done. I liked my omelet analogy better than that, than that one, but it's early. Um, and so where do we get these data from? Well, we're pushing towards, because we work at NASA, uh, uh, mostly remote sensing sources, and I'll show you the, the the likely candidates for that. But really in our studies, our first, uh, uh, well, our validation studies we use as much ground-based data. You know, in the United States, we have access to a lot of data, right? And so we can use all ground-based observations and show that, show that it works well. We've done that in Illinois and California and Oklahoma, and really all over the place in the US, uh, Colorado River Basin. But uh, if you're gonna write a paper uh, on India um, or in the Middle East, uh, you're not going to get very much data from, uh, from those folks. And so we rely on, a, on depending on the, depend, it just depends on what's available. Uh, on our India paper, we used all m model information. In our Middle East paper, we had uh, satellite observations of surface water, model observations of, uh, and model observations of snow and, and soil moisture. So it varies. And again, in California, we tend to use the best, uh, the best available. So this is what we've done in California. Um, and so there's the Grace time series on the left, and uh, we use the Weather Service SNODAS, which is a combination of snow pillow data and integrated into, uh, into models. So it's 
widely regarded as the best available statewide snow water equivalent. We use observations of surface water storage from the Department of Water Resources, just the heights and compute the volume changes. And we use model soil moisture because we don't really measure it. And we compute the errors on those and then we come up with a time series for groundwater, which I actually showed you in that combined USGS, um, uh, USGS Grace plot. But where we're going is really towards uh, doing as much as we can from satellites um, and then take a step further, which I'll describe in just a second. But the satellites that are their prime targets then are Grace for the total water storage. Uh, the ASO, which I showed you the uh, Airborne Snow Observatory, which is my friend Tom Painter flying around in a plane over the Sierras. Uh, but this is actually, you know, a lot of our satellites start off as aircraft prototype. So our hope is that this will be a satellite in, before we all retire. Uh, SWAT is a surface water mission that will measure uh, the heights and inundation extents of uh, uh, rivers and, and lakes around the world. Um, and there's an airborne component to that as well. And SMAP is the soil moisture mission that just launched um, at the end of, of January. Uh, so that's one direction that we're going. And the other is, I'm not going to make you read all this, but really the future for predicting where water is and how it's changing over time is to integrate. You know, we're in the golden age, really, of, of satellites now. And no one is perfect. And so we have to integrate them together in various ways. And one of the things that we do in our group is try to build better and better computer models that are progressively more realistic. And by better and better, I mean represent all the rivers, represent the groundwater, represent the snow, right, in an integrated, in an integrated way that interacts. And the basics of water management, like groundwater pumping, uh, like reservoir storage. It's a, it's a difficult task. So we're on an, ex all this is, telling you is that we're on an accelerated path uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to model the Western United States. It's called the Western States Water Mission. We're very proud of our little logo here. So my crowning achievement so far at JPL is to get that logo made. And we'll be modeling the Western US uh, at a three square kilometer for river basins, not grids, but use river basins catchments as a template, three square kilometers. Um, and I would show you what that looks like, but it's so high resolution that it just looks sort of like a mass of ink on the, uh, on the paper. And so the idea is to put all those satellites, integrate those in a rigorous mathematical framework and predict or reevaluate and or predict uh, where all of our water is and how it's changing over time. So do the best available job that NASA can do for the Western United States to show how much snow there is, how much soil moisture, how much surface water, how much groundwater, and, and how it's changing over time. Um, so we are on a, an accelerated path for that that keeps me up at night. This is a visual intermission, okay? This is, so we're gonna wrap up the California and move on to the rest of the world. And so I said that the 60 Minutes didn't like that one animation that I showed you. And so we did another one for them. And these are sort of like outtakes from that. And back to the communication thing, OK? So just you know, amongst our group here, this slide has very little information content. It's basically going from red, right, green, yellow, it's like a traffic signal. Um, and it's really a. a uh, a graph of the trends, it's, it's really mapping out the trend and it accumulated water storage over, over the, a change in water storage over, over the state. But it has very little information content scientifically, but tremendous impact publicly. And I think it just has to do with the colors. And I literally made this sitting at my kitchen table one morning and like, the, and I'm not kidding you, like the next night um, it was on, this is when, what's his name? I can't even remember his name. Brian Williams. It's when Brian Williams was still somebody. <laughs> and so he had it on the NBC Nightly News and it was in the LA Times. And, it was, it, it, and, and so I, I find it interesting as a scientist that the things that catch on are not the things that we hope might catch on or the things that really have a lot of information content. And so this is an example of one that took off and it still just has kind of a life of its own. All right, so let's look 
outside of California now, Colorado River Basin in the United States and, and around the world. Uh, so we did this study of the Colorado River Basin that came out last year um, and we wanted to explore uh, because of the situation that we you know, had seen in India, had seen in the Middle East, and seen in California, this idea that when, you know, there's not much, it's not rocket science, but when there's not much surface water available, when there's a drought, you know, people use more groundwater. And so we wanted to look at uh, if we could quantify that. So we looked at the Colorado River Basin, and we focused on this period of drought from 2005 to 2014, when the reservoirs were already very low. Okay, so meaning this is a time period that, that the region is going to be predisposed towards using more groundwater. And so we went through the exercise that I described of finding all these different data. And the bottom line is, is really in the bottom right. And what it shows is of the total change in the water storage, which you see, right, you see in the upper part, the ups and downs, the wet season, the dry season, but a clear trend, right? And so, well, well how much of that is surface water? How much of that is groundwater? What's going on? And that's this, that's this lower right. And the red line is actually the storage changes in Lakes Powell and the Mead, right? The, the two big, biggest reservoirs. And the blue line is the, is the disappearance of the groundwater. It's the groundwater uh, depletion. And, and the take home message here is we spend a lot of time uh, worrying about managing surface water everywhere and very little time worrying about groundwater and, and groundwater management and certainly like interstate groundwater issues. Um, and this figure sh uh, shows that the rate of disappearance of groundwater is six or seven to one compared to, compared to surface water. Now the surface water is renewable and uh, a lot of the groundwater is not. A lot of what we're looking at is, is what's happening in Arizona. Uh, and so it's just good to get this message out there. We can quantify it and it, it, you know, it makes sense. It compares well to observations. And uh, people need to recognize that this is, you know, again, it's not rocket science, but it's nice to finally have the tools to be able to put the picture together. Speaking of pictures, let's look at a couple more. So now we're looking at trends um, in the United States from Grace, looking over the past 12 years or so. And the blue is uh, gaining water in this time period. And the red is losing water. So you can see Nebraska's in that spot. Uh, it's actually gaining water. So again, in terms of what people are actually interested in, we've actually written a, a few papers on flooding, and no one cares. Uh, and we've shown that using, and especially in, the, in, in this region, in the upper Missouri River Basin, that big blue spot over there, that um, you can use GRACE data to better predict flood potential globally. We published that paper in 2009. I don't think it was cited until about 2014. Um, and then we published a paper in uh, Nature Geoscience, which is a pretty nice journal, on using GRACE to improve the prediction of the flooding potential uh, and improve the lead time. You know, because you're looking at this holistic measure of how much water is there. You know, a lot of our flood prediction is done just looking at soil moisture and, and rain. When you look at really how thoroughly saturated the ground is, like we do with GRACE, you get a much better picture. And so that paper. Uh, that came out last summer suggested that we could increase the lead time, not for a prediction of flooding, because you need to understand what's going to happen with the rain, but for flooding potential. What's the flood potential of the, of the region? And so we showed that we could increase the lead time by in including grace by uh, a couple of months, uh, which, you know, that translates into uh, to, to lives. Anyway, okay, so back to this. Uh, so a couple of things. The upper half of the country is getting wetter. And the lower half of the country is getting drier. And our big food producing regions, um, like the Central Valley and like the Ogallala, especially the southern part, um, are, are in trouble, as is the southeastern United States, uh, which a lot of people don't recognize unless you live there. And then when I travel out there, people say, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad here. Uh, so when you look at the high plains, and you know you can see that your region is pretty wet, right? And so we have, you know, you know this well, right? So it's the weather nor nor northern part and the drier southern part. We have a figure that I'll show you. The one that was shown last night shows really no trend in the high plains aquifer. That's because when you average over the whole thing, you've got the wet and dry, and so it kind of averages to averages to zero. So this actually fits into a global picture that I'll I'll, I'll show you. 
these are the, the, I'm sorry, the colors don't show up so well here, but these were mm -hmm. some, the same pictures that I showed on my cover slide from these papers in California and the Middle East and India. They've all had a huge impact, uh, certainly on regional water management uh, in California and, uh, um, and in India. Um, and I still get a lot of calls on the Middle East, especially from Israel. Um, in trying to figure out, in fact, the big Watec meeting was, was last week, right? And so uh, uh, folks there at Mecca Road are very interested in using the data to, uh, to try to understand what's going on in that region, in their region of, of the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula. The, the charts on the right are just our derived groundwater plots from going through this process of subtracting from grace the surface water and the soil moisture and, and, and the snow and some of the different rates. And I'll put those into a global uh, perspective in just a minute. Just have a couple of these animations for uh, India and for the, uh, the Middle East. It's not, uh, you know, it's a little bit like watching paint dry, but um, let's do it anyway. The Middle East one, I think, because it, it kind of has a sort of creeping tendency, um, captures a lot of a lot of attention. Then this is total water now. This is not just this is not just groundwater. But of the signal from our other from the studies that we've done, about two thirds of what we're looking at is actually groundwater. All right. Uh, so globally this is the picture that it emerges. And so these are the trends of water storage all over the world uh, from the GRACE data. Again the red is losing and the blue is uh, gaining. And the places that are losing the most water are the ice sheets. Uh, so Greenland and Antarctica and melting away and contributing to sea level rise uh, and increase in ocean mass. And then, and then after that, the next biggest ones are like up in Alaska and Patagonia. Uh, so those are the alpine glaciers that are melting away. Um, and then after that, most of those red spots that you see are sitting over the world's major aquifers. So whether we're talking about the Central Valley or the High Plains or we're over in the Arabian Peninsula or India, Bangladesh, North China Plain, uh, Northwestern Australia and, and, and Southern Africa, uh, we suspect that those are really due to mining, the water use from mining. Uh, and then of course the Wari Aquifer uh, is being pretty hard hit. And um, so this is, this, is not, this is not good. And the slide that you saw last night was basically a coarser resolution version of this. And so now we took these data and we averaged them up to the scale of the 37 biggest aquifers uh, in the world. And this is the one you saw last night. Uh, and the message here is that over half of the world's major aquifers are past sustainability tipping points where we define sustainability as uh, not using more than is renewed um, uh, annually on an annual basis. And uh, about a third of them are according to some criteria that, that, that we develop um, uh, severely stressed. Uh, so recharge is, is pretty limited. Um, and it's the usual suspects that, that pop out, you know, the, India, Bangladesh, China, uh, uh, Middle East, and Africa is starting to really show up in part because you know, it's, there's very little recharge happening there and I feel that it's quite vulnerable actually. It, as I talked with, spoke with some people yesterday with land grabbing and, and, and so on. So it's a global groundwater crisis uh, for sure and uh, there's a climate change side to it too. And the IPCC climate model suggests that the wet areas of the world are getting wetter uh, or should get wetter and the dry areas of the world are getting drier. The wet areas of the world are the high latitudes in the tropics and the dry is everything in between. And so I think that we're seeing that. There's the wet areas of the world, they're blue which means they're getting wetter. There's the dry areas, they're mostly yellow which means they're getting drier. Embedded in there is the, are the aquifers. Right, so it's not good. So I pose the question, is it happening? Um, all right, so what are we gonna do about, this is where I need sound. So just do a little bit on communication and kind of share with you some of the challenges 
in communicating their general message about freshwater availability and water stewardship and water use in agriculture. And so the setup, this is from, I, you know, I did some testimony, uh, congressional testimony on California and, and groundwater depletion and uh, uh, Congresswoman Grace Napolitano, who's a great water warrior, said, you gotta go, you know, you do more communication. You gotta get out there, go talk to the farmers, go, go set up a meeting. And, um, and so we did that and it was videoed. So this is a meeting that we set up in Fresno, invited farmers, Farm Bureau reps, uh, local politicians, and we want, it was in Fresno, we wanted to meet on their turf. Let me be abundantly clear about this. California faces a water crisis of potentially epic proportions. You know, how we respond today will define who we are tomorrow. Here locally, need additional storage. You know, I mean, they built reservoirs for a reason. Shasta, Hoover. If you owe the bank and the county taxes, you're gonna try to farm as much as you can. They're not gonna make more water. The only solution to this thing is conservation. I agree we should look into conservation, but that's not going to yield or have any effect on our groundwater shortage. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get into this, but your arguments about conservation and efficiency are just wrong. And if you're right, that conservation and efficiency isn't going to get us anything. And if I'm right, that there's not a lot of new supply out there, then what are we left with? Take land out of production. I don't know anyone who, I don't know anyone who wants that. Your arguments just don't make any sense. You have to live in the valley. You have to understand the management of the water here. Oh, that's bad management. And, and you're one of the managers. I'm sorry. I'm here. <laughs> that, that whole system. I wanted to make a statement that we do face a crisis now of, of, of epic proportions. And, and I said that. Um, and I'm not sure that it really resonated, which to me is a little startling. When we talk about water. We need a plan, and we don't have one. And it is complex. We're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I used to think that we're screwed, but then my thinking really uh, evolved. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, the other thing that I've done a fair amount of, which is also, you know, there's pitfalls involved, and so the last year, last three years, sorry, about once a year, I write an op-ed for the, for the LA Times. And it's basically like the same op-ed, but just updated, like, well, we're kind of running out of water, you know, three years ago, and so we better prepare. And, you know, two years ago, oh, we have less water than we did, you know, last year, and, and, and so we better prepare. And then last, last March, like, wow, we really don't have much water left in our reservoirs. We really need to get on it. And what happened was kind of a cautionary tale for those of us who, who get out there and do a lot of communication. This was basically, you know, the theme of the op-ed was, well, we're kind of up a creek without a paddle, but, you know, we don't have a creek because they're like the rivers are dry, right? <laughs> and, and we don't really have a paddle, meaning we don't really have a good plan. And so I called for some of these things. And, but what happened was, as a writer, as an op-ed writer, you don't write the headline. In fact, they don't even like you to submit headlines and the headline that they put on this piece was this and so all over the news and so this thing was truly viral and and uh, you know I had one line in the in the op-ed that said uh, hey I and I said it to you today right like our reservoirs don't hold much water we don't have much left Therefore, the groundwater is really threatened, and we better really watch it. That's, that's basically what I said. And so the headline was, California will run out of water in one year. <laughs> and, and then the press doesn't distinguish between a scientific paper and an op-ed, right? And so I worked for NASA. And so then all over the press was, NASA says <laughs> California will run out of water in, in one year. If, I, I swear, they, if they could have fired me, say I didn't do anything wrong, but if I had violated some kind of NASA policy, they probably would have fired me. Um, so that was great, that was great fun. Um, <laughs> and, 
and we call for a bunch of things and, and many of them happen whether it's coincidence or not. I wasn't trying to be critical of the governor's office at all, just giving sort of an independent opinion of what we see from satellites and basically the things that we've been talking about today. Uh, just a aside about what about sewage recycling and desalination. Uh, so this is my group a couple of years ago at the famous uh, uh, groundwater replenishment system in Orange County, Fountain Valley. Uh, we recycle our sewage water. Uh, we use about 50% of it as a barrier for saltwater intrusion and we recharge the aquifer with the, the other 50%. Uh, when you go to Orange County, it's pretty lush, okay? And so this is part of the reason why. Uh, on the other hand, we don't really grow any food in Orange County, so my view is evolving that you know, sustainability during a drought, even with uh, decreasing groundwater supplies, is achievable in metropolitan regions. It's the food, right, that as we heard last night, and some of those numbers that we heard last night were, were real eye-openers. And so it's growing the food that's gonna be the problem, and sewage recycling isn't gonna help us there because there's just not enough of us to generate the sewage. We just opened uh, in Carlsbad, which is just up from San Diego, the new desalination plant. I guess it's the biggest one in the United States. And um, I think it's cool. I think it's uh, uh, useful for, for San Diego. I think it, it given their, their unique situation there, um, uh, it's okay. It's just, you know, there are a lot of downsides to, uh, still, to desalination. Uh, it's expensive, it's energy intensive, we have to do something with the brines. Um, it might work in San Diego. I'm much more in favor of conservation and efficiency and you know, lowering the demand side. I think that, we, especially in agriculture, I think that there's a lot that, that can be done there before we spend billions. The Australia example, by the way, right? They fired up, built how, how, uh, $15 billion, uh, Australian, so about $10 billion US, to build their desal plants and uh, haven't used them, right? And so that's the problem of getting back to California and the Western US. Planning during a crisis is very difficult. People want action, people want to spend money, and sometimes it's, it's, it's just a difficult situation to be in. I won't go through this except to say, when it comes to groundwater, it's not just a, a Western US or United States problem. I showed you, it's a global problem, but you know, we don't really have good global groups to go to. There's, there's no one in charge and, you know, groundwater is often dealt with country by country. And as our speaker said last night, you know, if we thought of the world as one country, we could figure out how to, how to do it. And so maybe what we need to be thinking about is region by region, how to have these uh, uh, better treaties that accommodate both surface water and groundwater together. Uh, but we do need to accept that we use way more than we have available. That's why we have all those red spots. For the most part, that's why we have all those red spots over all of those aquifers, right? We're dipping into our strategic reserve and we're hitting it pretty, uh, we're hitting it pretty hard. So we need to figure out uh, how much we have, how much it's changing over time. Just like our speaker said last night, if it were oil, this, this would have been done. Uh, I mentioned we need to be thinking more carefully about managing surface water and groundwater together. We need to be doing much better measuring, monitoring, reporting of groundwater quality and quantity. You, you know, this group knows all of this, including sharing data across political boundaries. And those could be state boundaries and those could be international boundaries. And this is, of course, a big, a big, big problem. One that I hope that satellites will alleviate uh, because, you know, is it to, yeah, I visited Tunisia and Libya a few years ago and neither side wanted to share data with me, right? Because they didn't want the other one to know how much groundwater they were using. But if we can start to see this stuff from satellites, then you know, we kind of know, the same thing with the Middle East, right? We, we, we can kind of see what's going on. So it's probably in everyone's best interest to contribute to a, a data and information system. And again, recognizing groundwater as a critical element of national and international water supplies. I think groups like ours, so I'm refining my final message, and I'm gonna add one more bullet point to this. So uh, this group, the work that I do, and part of the reason why I do a lot of communication is because, you know, as a professor, as an educator, I think that if people really understand where the water's coming from, right? The snow in the mountains is disappearing, the groundwater's disappearing, right? The reservoirs are emptying out. They will accept the fact that they can't really water their two acre lawn, right? I hope. Uh, and so together, I think we need to work to raise awareness of these critical water issues. The third bullet point 
which I'll probably add in here, is that I don't think we can do it alone. And I think that we have to really uh, engage with the dark side, the dark side being industry. Sorry to all industry people there. No, I mean, industry, right, has all the money. They have tremendous clout. <coughs> Use all the water, especially the food industry. Um, and <coughs> I just don't think, so I, I, you know, and others now, I had an op-ed in the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, is calling on the leadership of the food industry. We have to, we have to produce food. Uh, you know, I love to eat, I loved our dinner. Jane, that was an awesome dinner last night. Uh, so, right, I love to, right, we love to eat. And it takes a lot of water to, to grow food. And so we need to engage the industry to help us, uh, to help us save, that, save that water. Uh, you know, I'm not a holier than thou guy, and this is gonna prove it, all right? <laughs> this is a ticket that I got. I live outside of Pasadena in a little town called Sierra Madre. And I found this ticket on my door, and it's a water ticket. And it was on my door in the middle of August. And it says this, your water, meeting is, your water meter reading is higher than usual. It is suggested that you inspect and repair, if necessary, all water connections, giving special attention to toilets. Small leaks can cause substantial increases in your water bill. The real answer for the higher water use is that my son was home from college and taking <laughs> <laughs> extremely lengthy showers. But we did find some leaks, actually. We did find some, and the whole town is actually quite, quite leaky. But we found some leaks. Uh, and so I think this sort of thing, I mean, I'm not embarrassed by this at all. I think it's a good thing for, uh, you know, we need that until we've got like super smart meters in every house that can send us text messages in the middle of the night. Oh, by the way, speaking of the middle of the night, I found out last night that my water heater, we were renting out our house in Irvine while we live in Pasadena and the water heater exploded. Oh, nice. Yes. And there's a Chinese non-English speaking family living in the house. And my wife had to deal with it because I was hanging out with you guys. <laughs> uh, but I think, it's, I think it's under control. 